All right, my name is Billy Atwell. I'm the Chief Communications Officer for the Diocese. Thank you all for, for being here and participating here. And thank you, Archbishop, for your, for your reflection. I think we're all very inspired by it. So we will be um, going through questions now that you have submitted. Um, we've received uh, dozens of questions, so we're gonna get through as many as we can. We're trying to keep it contained to the, the topic of um, Eucharist and the Mass. Um, Archbishop, are you ready? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I think you are. They look friendly. <laughs> All right, well, the very first question that says, um, the lay faithful are supposed to have full active participation in the Mass, but what is full active participation? Well, a, a full participation for a human being includes all that we are, our mind, our bodies, our hearts, our souls. So full and active participation is celebrating Mass with all those things engaged. It means, uh, most of all, that we take it seriously, right? And that we know what we're doing. And any kind of liturgical renewal is a re renewal in the, in the direction of understanding better, loving more, giving ourselves more generously, and experiencing the reality of Christ present in the sacrament. So it, the, the full and active participation means what it says, that our, we fully participate and we're active. Now, we can do that in different ways. Um, some people think that it's, they prefer to just sit in the back of the church and not pay attention to anybody else and, and pray during the course of Mass. And I'm fully participating in my own way. And of course, they may well be, and who wants to, who would ever make a judgment? But the church wants us to listen, to sing, to um, give good example to one another in the church because we celebrate the Mass together. And, and so generally those, those uh, words uh, describing what we should be doing means that we really are participating with the Mass as it's designed to be celebrated by hearing and understanding, by singing and praying, and not just doing private devotions at the time the Mass is being celebrated. That doesn't mean people who don't want to do that are bad. It just means they're not doing what they're supposed to do at that time, which is actively <laughs> participation in the fullness of the sacrament. Beautiful. How can we explain the beauty of Jesus in the Eucharist and reach young people in an age that prefers text, screens, virtual reality um, to teach the real presence um, over individualism? I don't have any idea. <laughs> <laughs> no, let me, let me say something, something very fundamental. Uh, many of you and, and many of us bishops think that if we just tell people what's true, we've done our duty. If we tell them it's a real presence, then we've done our duty. But I want to assure you, no one believes that the Eucharist is really Jesus Christ, body and soul, humanity and divinity, because we told them so. I don't believe that because the nuns told me that in grade school. I don't believe that because my parents told me that at home. I believe it because Jesus tells me so. And unless you believe Jesus, there's no way you're gonna believe that something that looks like bread or looks like wine is truly his body and his blood. It can't because the church tells us so, it's because Jesus says so and we believe Jesus. We believe that Jesus instituted the church. So if the church speaks for him, we believe what the church says. But it all goes back to believing in Jesus in a real relationship with him. And so fundamentally, that's what we have to do. We have to find some way of helping people understand the Lord Jesus risen from the dead who comes to them in, in their lives. And just repeating the truth or repeating the catechism in itself won't work. Now, I believe in teaching and the catechism and teaching kids, but again, they won't really believe it unless they believe Jesus says it. And they won't believe Jesus says that unless they believe Jesus. They won't, don't believe that he exists, that he's risen from the dead, that he dwells in the church. So it's all getting back ultimately to a real relationship with the Lord as individuals and as a community. So it's just having more catechism classes in and of itself won't work. You know, you can teach that to kids as catechism and they go home with their families who don't go to mass. How long will they believe that? I think the bishops here will tell you 
is I will tell you that most of the kids that I confirmed in Philadelphia the last 10 years don't go to church on Sunday because their parents don't go. Most of them. And do they believe what, what they've learned and memorized? They might have for a moment, but it, it fades away when they start watching those 9,000 hours of television and see Catholics who claim to be Catholic, men who claim to be Catholics, like our president or like Nancy Pelosi, uh, say one thing and do another. Those things are much more convincing than what they learned in second grade catechism. So we gotta get back to authenticity in our own lives and in the and expectations around that for people who claim to be Catholics or we're not gonna pass on the faith. Why must we be in a state of grace to receive the Eucharist? Are sinners of any faith not the ones who need to be nourished with the body of Christ the most? Well, this is, this is a little graphic, so I hope you don't mind me being graphic, but should a, should a husband and wife have a marital relationship if they don't love each other? And the answer is no, it's a lie. They're saying one thing with their body, but that's not what they're really saying with their heart. And the same thing's true about the Eucharist. If we receive the Lord without fully embracing the gospel and asking forgiveness for our sins, we're lying. So receiving Holy Communion outside of a state of grace is a lie. And anything that's a lie is not good. It's just, it's bad. And we expect that in our personal lives. Why wouldn't we expect it in our, our life with God? Well, that's why it's so important. Now, the Eucharist does forgive our sins because God always forgives our sins when he touches us. But when it comes to the grievous sins in our lives, the Lord expects us to accept the grace of forgiveness through, through lives of repentance. And the way we do that as Catholics is by making ourselves available to the graces of going to confession of the sacrament of penance. And that prepares us so that we can actually mean it when we receive the Eucharist. You know, again, the marital act is probably the most dramatic example of what we mean by communion, which is union of two people into one, right? So when we talk about a holy communion, we're talking about union. And we should be as serious about that kind of uh, relationship with God as we are in choosing our bride or our husband and making those basic decisions about our family life. And we don't, we're casual about going communion. We walk up the aisle and pat everybody on the shoulder on the way and, and talk about what went on this week at the grocery store rather than focusing our attention on the Lord. See, I go off a lot, so you ought to keep me, <laughs> keep me we focused. We have plenty of questions. So. Uh, what are your thoughts on Traditionis Custodis and the traditional Latin Mass? I didn't understand the question. What are your thoughts on Traditionis Custodis and the traditional Latin Mass? Well, I have a lot of thoughts about that. Um, I'll try to answer it. Um, I am a, a priest who was born in 1944 and grew up at the time of the Second Vatican Council. Um, I actually was ordained prior to the craziness that accompanied the council. And I had wonderful professors of theology and liturgy and those kind of things. So I'm deeply grateful for that. But I am a man of the council. I believe that council, Second Vatican Council, like every council of the church, is a gift of the Holy Spirit uniquely preparing a particular time in the life of the church. So I think it's dangerous if people reject the council and especially one of the most important parts of the council, which is its document on the sacred liturgy. And it's my personal experience that many people who are attached to the Tridentine form simultaneously reject many parts of the council. And I think that's a very bad thing. Now, I also know many Catholics who love the Tridentine form and go to it faithfully who accept the council. But for many of the people, you don't have to scratch them very hard before they bleed anti-council thoughts and sentiments. And I think that 
Pope Francis decided to act as he did because he was afraid, you know, the Pope is afraid like everybody else, that those anti-council folks were being, the numbers were beginning to increase, especially among young seminarians and young priests, and he wanted to make sure that the direction the church headed at the time of the council would be followed into the future. Now, I also th personally think that the way the Pope did that was rather harsh and imprudent, and I think it just made the people who love the Tridentine form angry, and then they become harder, uh, and they're convinced that the council's bad because the Pope has treated them so badly. So I can, at the same, at, at the same time, believe that it was an imprudent way of handling the situation, but I also understand why the Pope thought he needed to act at this time. Because in my personal experience as a bishop, it is true that many of the younger seminarians and younger priests were beginning to distance themselves from the council, not only on the teachings of liturgy, but also other things, and somehow uh, abandoning the council to the, dis, uh, the dustbin of history rather than as the chief gift of the Holy Spirit to the church of our time. <coughs> now, some of you might want to argue with me, and I'm happy to take any arguments, but that's what I think. <laughs> and I know that what I'm thinking historically is based on the fact that the Pope saw that, that this was happening among the young clergy and the uh, young people in the church. It's happening in Philadelphia, you know, so I imagine it's happening even in Arlington, Virginia. Why does it seem that many Protestants and others who do not believe in the Eucharist still appear to have life in them? Well, I, I think that uh, even when I sin, I still have life in me. You know, even if I'm not a full believer in the fullest sense that I practice what I preach, God's grace still is active in me. And if it's true about me, why wouldn't it be true about Protestants? And especially Protestants who are very serious about uh, embracing the gospel, even though they don't have the privilege that we have had of growing up in a long tradition of Catholic faith. You know, so God works where he wants, right? He doesn't just work with the perfect or else he wouldn't work at all. He works with what's there. And quite honestly, they have developed some aspects of our faith better than we have. You know, for example, their love for scripture. It would be hard to find that love for scripture in the lives of most Catholics who don't even have a Bible. And it, it doesn't mean that we have to be Bible thumpers, as they say, but is there anything wrong with loving the Bible and knowing it by heart and reading it every day? Does that make you less uh, a Christian than those of us who have to dust the Bible off every time we take it off the shelf because it's been that long? So that's my answer. You know, they, they have much to teach us. We have more to teach them but we ought to learn from one another and come to the unity that God has, that Jesus has prayed for for his church. So. Would anything that touches the flesh of Christ in the Eucharist, Eucharistic miracle, become a relic? I don't, I don't think we have any relics uh, related to the body of Christ. We have relics related to his crucifixion and his... Um, death. Uh, we don't, you know, the shroud, I'm thinking of the nails of the crown of, the crown of thorns, but uh, relics uh, when in, re in relationship to the risen Lord are about those kind of things. So I, I don't think you would consider um, something touched to the Holy Eucharist as a relic. Otherwise, I'd be a relic. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, is that the question? Yes, that was it. <laughs> now, you know, I have a, a priest friend who preached a homily once that I'll never forget. He says, just as we, take, we genuflect before the tabernacle in our churches, we should genuflect before every baptized Christian that we meet because 
the Holy Spirit dwells within them as truly as the body and blood of Christ dwell in our churches. Now, I, I think that faith is true, but I haven't started yet reflecting to other people. But it's really important for us to understand that Christ is present for us in many ways, and acknowledging those many ways in no way undermines the reality of the Lord's presence to us in his Eucharistic body and blood. This next question was asked by somebody with celiac disease, and they asked, why is gluten a part of the host? I have no idea how to answer that, except that why is cancer present in the bodies of newborn babies? Or why do, um, why does my, why did my parents get divorced? <coughs> and there's all kinds of problems in the world. Some of them are because of deliberate personal sin, but some of them are because of the original sin of Adam and Eve, where our world has been fractured. Now, why do I have a, an unresponsive foot at the age of 75 when I was looking forward to traveling and preaching and doing all those kind of things? I don't know the answer to that, but I don't have to know the answer to it, right? I mean, we don't have to know the answer for everything. Um, I think that it's important for the church to be very sensitive to those who suffer from celiac disease and other things that make them very sensitive to hosts with gluten in them. But I think those of us who suffer that way, and they are of us, they're members of the church, have to understand that the church can't change the teachings of Jesus about the Eucharist by consecrating um, whatever because it doesn't have gluten in it. We just, we just can't do that. We have to accept the cross that comes in living in a broken world, broken by the sin of Adam and Eve, in which we all participate. Public celebrations of the Mass were suspended for a time during COVID throughout the world. Uh, if we have a pandemic again, do you think the Church should react differently? You know, I retired two weeks before the pandemic hit. <laughs> <laughs> And am I grateful? <laughs> because I didn't have to make those decisions. And because I didn't have to make them, I'm very slow to criticize those who made the decisions. I have no idea what decision I would have made because I didn't have to make it. Now, it seems like we've, and we understand things very differently than we did three years ago. It seems like faith, face masks don't really protect us like we thought they did, they would. We also know that children don't seem to get the disease and suffer very much from it. So I think the fear that led to those dramatic gestures uh, is not going to be present if something like this happens again and would we'll be more careful about closing things down or closing them down for such a long time when maybe it didn't make much difference according to the studies we've done. So I think it'll be different because we know more. We were living, if it happened in our lifetime, we've lived through it already. But I don't know what decisions should have been made differently. It seemed we came back very slowly, but that just seems to me that we did. You know, I don't know. Why do you have to criticize what was done? You just, it's done. Maybe it was right, maybe it wasn't. We'll just live on, do our best. But let's not sit in criticism of those who had to make the decision when we didn't have to make it. But it's probably Bishop Burbage's fault. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly isn't my fault or, <laughs> or Bishop Paul, we were innocent, we were retired. <laughs> All right, so the next question is, how did you get to be so countercultural, and how can we strongly emulate Christ in the midst of our woke times? You know, I, I, I'm always surprised when I'm painted by the left. It's always by the left as a cultural war, warrior and being countercultural. I've never set out to do that. I don't see myself in that way. I try to follow the gospel, and it seems like if Jesus said so, we ought to take him in his word and say the same thing today ourselves. Uh, he's... The Lord taught us, and Pope John Paul II taught us not to be afraid, 
So I'm not afraid. But it isn't a virtue that I've acquired. It's just something that I'm not afraid. I'm just not afraid. I believe in the gospel. I believe in the church. I believe the risen Lord is present to us. And because of that, I do what I do. I think the worst thing is to try to be countercultural. But if we try to be Catholic, we will be without trying. And that's what counts, that we try to be Catholic everywhere at all times without exception. And then we're going to be pretty miserable to live with in a woke world where they don't like those kind of things. And can I say this, if you want your bishops to be courageous, what you ought to do is be courageous yourself. And then they will. We try to compete with you. If you're holy, we'll be holy. If, you try to, if you're courageous, we'll be courageous. This is really true, by the way. It really is true. Now, we have a right to expect our leaders to lead and give us a good example. I don't deny that. But the best way to get them to lead is by leading yourselves and giving a good example and always being charitable even when you disagree with someone. And some people in your diocese have treated your bishop terribly about the Tridentine Mass. There are a few bishops who have been as generous and courageous in applying the church's law as generously as your bishop has. So. so if you're critical of him for that, get over it. <laughs> you have no idea what it's like in other places, I'll tell you that. Um, the next question is, how can we as a Eucharistic people um, respond to those who are living a sinful life intentionally without affirming what they are doing? Well, I'd have to have an example to be able to give you an answer. You know, if we, um, we live in a pluralistic society, so we live with other people who don't believe what we believe, and we have a Christian duty to love them, right? And if, let's say if we're neighbors with a gay couple that's married, it would be important for us to show basic neighborliness and charity. But it's also important for us to teach our children in our families and our grandchildren, if they come to visit us, that that's not normal or good or acceptable behavior for us. You can be charitable and clear at the same time. I think that's true in an example of a neighborhood. But I think, let's say, if, if in the Catholic Church, if we have people who come to church regularly and have chosen a lifestyle contrary to the gospel, and one example of that is sexual relationships, but it's not the only example. But let's say a, a couple who are living together who were previously married to some other people, we can't pretend that that isn't going on or hasn't happened. If you read uh, St. Paul's letters, those kind of things happened in the early church. And St. Paul called them out, you know. And we, we try so hard uh, to be um, accepting or accompanying that we sometimes never get around to challenging. And it seems to me that Jesus got crucified because he challenged, not because he accepted. So you can accept someone and challenge them at the same time. Don't you do that to your spouse and your children every day? Don't you? You let your children do what they want so you won't offend them? No, you do it. You challenge them because you love them. And it seems to me that we should be that way in our relationships. It shouldn't be, I mean, people who don't live the Catholic life certainly can come to church on Sunday. There's nothing wrong with that. But if they receive Holy Communion, they ought to be challenged um, by their pastor and by their fellow Christians that this isn't acceptable for us. Otherwise, it's going to spread as a cancer and, and become acceptable, right? Because we'll forget it ourselves. It's all, it's all about remembering and then being faithful to what we we know to be true.
What can lay people do to support our priests and our bishops and encourage them to have a trusting relationship with one another? Well, I, as I said earlier, I don't want to repeat myself. I'll just briefly say, give us good example. You're good about giving us meals and giving us money, but you're really poor at giving us good example. <laughs> and that's what we need. We need your good example. We need your courage and your charity and your passion for the gospel. And that's how we become courageous and passionate ourselves. Look at the early church, the Acts of the Apostles. It was lay people who spread the faith more than Peter and 12 apostles. Our church would still be very small if it were just the clergy who were busy about doing that. It was the housewives in Rome who were faithful to their husbands and who cared for the poor that led to the conversion of the Roman Empire. It wasn't the preaching of St. Paul. He may have got it started, but it didn't spread except through the example of the laity. You and I are co-responsible for the church. You're as responsible for the church as I am. A different way, but just as responsible. And we ought to act that way. We ought to, we ought to have mercy on these people. They probably want to go. <laughs> if the Eucharist is our daily bread, but we cannot go to daily Mass, are we still fed daily by the Eucharist if we receive only on Sunday? Well, it's important not to be more Catholic than the church. You understand that. And the church, church requires us to go to Mass how often? Once a week on Sunday. Not just, a, not just once a week, but on Sunday. That's a requirement. It's still a mortal sin to miss Mass on Sunday without good reason. You know that. I gave a homily once 20 years ago where I said, you remember the days when it was a sin to miss Mass on Sunday and everybody raised their hand? I said, well, it still is. And well, the people didn't think so, actually, you know. It still is. Um, so I think the church has seen that a weekly celebration of the Eucharist is the way most people are fed. If you feel galled by grace and God's love to celebrate more oftenly, more often, like daily Mass, that's a wonderful thing. But, you know, I don't have a duty as a priest to have Mass every day. People think I do, but I don't. Priests have the same obligation you do to go to Mass on Sunday. Now, most of us celebrate every day. And it's a good thing. Religious, I know we have some religious sisters here in religious communities generally have daily mass. And we have it offered in our parishes. But the fact you go to daily mass doesn't make you better than somebody who goes once a week. <coughs> it just makes you different. What do you think will need to happen for there to be a real conversion of the church in America? What has to happen for a conversion of the church in America? Well, historically, it's when disasters happened. Everybody comes back for a while. You remember 9-11? Those of you old enough remember that. It was incredible how many people came back to church for about six weeks. But it's, about, it's as long as it lasted. But that seems to be when people get converted, when they're scared. Otherwise, no matter how poor we think we are, we are will wealthy, independent, autonomous people in the United States. We don't think we need God. We take care of ourselves. We have lots of money, and that keeps us from being converted. It's when we are dependent and anxious that we turn to God. So it's really important for us to learn how to do that without disaster in our lives, without waiting for a disaster to happen. But I think that's the only way it will happen. You know, the, even the Roman Empire, when it was converted, I would imagine 10% of people took it seriously. The rest joined as cultural Catholics. That was true in the time of the Edict of Milan as much as it is true today. So I, I don't, I hope the Lord doesn't punish us that way, but he might, and that might bring us back. But don't expect your church to grow. It's going to get smaller, and it's going to get smaller, and we have to accept that and find ways of creatively preparing for that because the early centuries of the church didn't even have buildings. So we can't equate the faith with a beautiful compound, you know, with a church and lots of priests and Catholic school. Those are really nice. They, at some time they worked, sometimes they didn't. 
you know, you know, and I come from Philadelphia, which is one of the biggest and most successful churches in the history of the United States. And now 18% of people go to Mass on Sunday. 18%. We have huge numbers of Catholic schools. Every Catholic my age went to Catholic school. Everyone. They don't go to church. So those institutions don't prove a thing. You're no more of a, no more of a Catholic because you went to a Catholic school than you are a car because you walk through a garage. It, it doesn't. It's, it's personal belief, right? And commitment that makes all the difference. So that's what counts. Numbers don't count. It's the quality of the commitment. And when it's real, we have enough vocations and we have enough of everything. I personally believe we have enough vocations in the church for those who are practicing the faith. That's why we have fewer than before, because we have fewer people, fewer people practicing the faith. When people practice, there's a lot more vocations. Given the power of marketing, are there aspects from it that can be applied properly to evangelizing the Eucharist and the gospel? That's a really big question, and it really I don't want to dismiss it because it's a very important one, and it's something for people who are very much aware of marketing and the like to become involved in, that they bring those skills to the life of the church. And it would really be a great gift to be given. I don't know the answer to it now, but I think that we ought to take all of our secular gifts and baptize them, give them to the gospel so that they're effective there. I personally am a capitalist. I believe that capitalism is the best form of, of economic justice that we've seen in the history of the world. That's why everybody wants to come to the United States, even though we're criticized by so many. But I think economic um, capitalism can be very cruel and unchristian at the same time. But I think it can be, it can be baptized in a, in a Christian kind of way. But it's generally done better if people are converted than if the government imposes it, you know? And that's the danger about government control of those things, is it imposes it, it doesn't change people's hearts. And then they try to work their way around it, right? So it causes all kinds of problems. Don't you, haven't you had enough of me? <laughs> so one more question, then we're gonna go home. <laughs> All right, last question. How does the Synod on Synodality help us focus and refocus on the Eucharist? I don't know what's going to happen um, in terms of the Eucharist and the Synod on Synodality. Um, I'm personally worried about the Synod because I've seen the reports that came from local communities and are basically negative and complaining and proposing agenda that... Um, would be contrary to the teachings of the church. Um, I have seen very little mention of the wonderful things that are happening in the church today. Uh, for example, the number of vocations to the priesthood that you have in the Diocese of Arlington. There are all kinds of things, wonderful movements in the church, new religious orders, renewal of commitment of young people in college programs like Focus and the like. There's no mention of any of that. It's all about gender dysphoria and marriage for gay people and communion for people who are um, not annulled after a previous marriage. Um, it seems like the process was gotten a hold of by the complainers and those who are living pious Catholic lives, happy trying to follow the gospel, didn't participate. And I hope that won't then be used for pressure to try to get the church to adapt and adopt insane policies regarding contemporary wokeness in our culture. So I worry about that. Um, and the only way that's going to uh, not happen is if we all do our best to make it not happen by living Catholic lives and insisting on the same from the teachers of the church. Now, we have a program in, the, in this country about the Eucharist renewal, Eucharist renewal, that's a three-year program that can be very effective, I think, in restoring uh, commitment to the Eucharist. But again, I want to say what I said before. None of us, by simply telling people they should believe, are going to accomplish that. They have to believe Jesus, and then they'll believe the church. So just more catechism is not the answer. 
the answer is more conversion and then more catechism. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. No, no, no. It's time now for the real star of the occasion. We're going to have benediction. And the real star of the church is, is the Lord Jesus. You know, I found something else as I was preparing for this. I didn't know this. One last thing. You know when the church started benediction? Uh, there were some signs of it in the 13th century. How old is the church? More than 21 centuries now, right? So for more than half the life of the church, we didn't have an addiction. I was surprised by that, you know? Now, we always had belief in the real presence, communion of the, uh, the holy communion taken to the sick and the dying, always a belief in the real presence. But I mentioned that just so you know, some of the very important, deep traditions of our prayer are recent in some sense compared to the long life of the church. And what this teaches us is not that they're not important, it's just that they haven't always been important, and it's important for us to be open to new kinds of expressions of belief that lead us to a deeper understanding of the Eucharist in the future, because the church continues to grow, right? And, and doctrine continues to develop in the sense that it builds on what went before. doesn't deny what went before, but builds on what went before. So the more we have devotion to the Eucharist, the more we'll develop a real, lively, Eucharistic devotion in the life of the church today. Thank you again for your attention. Bye-bye. <laughs>